We have several breaking news stories that were announced this morning. First, Elon Musk just confirmed that Tesla will have genuinely useful human and robots in low production for Tesla's internal use next year and high production for other companies in 2026. This is much faster than most were expecting. Second, Elon also just announced that XAI's supercluster in Memphis was launched this morning with 100,000 liquid-cooled H100s. He says it's the most powerful AI training cluster in the world. Third, in a very confident way, Tesla's director of autopilot Ashoka Swami said that if you like the FSD version 12.4, you're going to love 12.5. Fourth, we'll show you six companies not named Tesla that also promised FSD but have failed to do so. And finally, Tesla just announced 1.99% APR financing for Model Y in the U.S., that makes four promotions at the same time. So I've got Jeff Lutz joining us. Uh, Jeff is a multi-decade supply chain executive and chief quality officer and now CEO of his own high-tech manufacturing consulting firm. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah, we're great to be with you. There's a lot going on. Holy cow. <laughs> Let's get through it. Okay, so the first bit of news that just was breaking came out this morning. Elon Musk announced that Tesla will have genuinely useful human and robots in low production for Tesla's internal use next year, and hopefully high production for other companies in 2026. He did this because this guy posted this Coco Tajlo's predictions in a diagram. Uh, Coco, Daniel Coco Tajlo is the former OpenAI researcher, and he basically gave predictions of when he thinks big tech advancements will happen each year from 2024 to 29. So 2024 is GPT next. This is an autonomous agent, a better GPT. 2025, it's an autonomous agent. AI becomes widely adopted as personal assistance. 2026, that's when you get super intelligent AGI. Surpasses human level performance in most tasks. 27 is when you get ASI, artificial super intelligence. 28 is nanobots. And 2029 is when he thought human and robots will be there. This is uh, robots with physical capabilities similar to humans, surpassing humans, and being able to do real potentially transforming industries. Well, this is where Elon replied, and that's where he said, no, we're going to see bots coming out in our own use next year. And 2026, high production sold to other companies. What's your thoughts, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, I think with these roadmaps, I think you look out, it's good to have a multi-year roadmap, but I think the first couple of years, you can place a, a little bit higher uh, confidence on these things happening. They're already under development and there's there's more line of sight to them. Um, on Elon's response, I think there's a fundamental disconnect um, between companies that are designing these robots and then the AI, the separate AI companies like OpenAI that are supporting them versus what Tesla can do and Tesla knows from a vertically integrated uh, you know, history that they have in terms of their own manufacturing. And that is all of these companies, none of them do their own manufacturing. If they've ever even done any high volume design work uh, and, and, and shipped a high volume product before, they ship it over to another company. And yes, their people work with that other company, but they work with, with a contract manufacturer and that's different. That's different than doing your own manufacturing. And what happens in that relationship, this could be its, its own entire show, to be honest with you, but it's a very complex relationship where you have targets as a designer and the contract manufacturing company has their own targets. And what they're trying to do is they're, they build in a margin in the beginning, and then they try to figure out how to extract more margin later on. Why am I saying all this? I think Tesla understands that beyond the general movement of these robots, that they have to be able to form, they, they have to be able to perform at a certain rate uh, uh, in terms of speed and in terms of accuracy. And they have to be able to come up their own ramp curve while they're inside of a station. And this is what Tesla does today with humans. And this is what Tesla does today with robot arms from uh, KUKA, Fanuc, and so forth. And these things have been studied for years and they understand this, the, the starting speed capability and what, what end state could possibly look like. And this is how companies extract more value out of their manufacturing process and lower their cost structure is they improve throughput. How do you improve throughput? You can reduce the process time, you can improve the yield. So how much good product is coming out uh, and you can, you can simplify the process or you can increase the speed of the process or you can do this combination all within. 
So why am I saying all this? I think Tesla uniquely understands this because they have you know hundreds, if not thousands of people that work on designing manufacturing processes today that are automated, semi-automated, and human only. Human, semi, and fully automated. You put that together and you have a humanoid robot. So for the last decade, Tesla has been really honestly working on this perfect recipe of like, how do you design a manufacturing station with humans, with robots? How do you improve its efficiency? And they're the only ones that we know today, potentially outside of maybe one China manufacturer that can build an EV profitably. So bringing this back to humanoids, I think the interesting advantage that Tesla has here is that history and that ability to understand that you can't just design for the target, you have to design for the target, the movement, the speed, the accuracy, and you have to be able to do all these things together. Do I think the other humanoid robot manufacturers are looking at this? Yes, but in terms of understanding the evolution of, of building a manufacturing station and where these robots are gonna be placed, I think Tesla's got, gonna have unique capability. And so when Elon talks about putting these in the, the factory next year, they really wanna evaluate the human example, the semi-automated example, and then the fully uh, robotic arm example, and then where can humanoid robots come in and replace? And my prediction is, is a lot of people are focused on replacing humans, but there are several fully automated processes where a humanoid could come in and also replace that capital as well. So this could be its own show, but I think with mm -hmm. Elon, I think Tesla has a unique position here from its manufacturing experience. And I think that beyond human labor, there's going to be, all, sorry, beyond capital, beyond human labor uh, uh, replacement, right. there's also going to be a big capital element. Thank you so much, Jeff. Your experience in manufacturing is very helpful. Um, yeah, so I, the, the, I think the key word is that there's going to be high production by 2026 sold to other companies. And like you just said, Tesla happens to be, I mean, years and years and years of experience, leaders, hard for others to copy. So that's uh, another big news uh, story that came out this morning. Elon confirmed, he said, nice work by XAI team, the X team, and NVIDIA. And supporting companies getting Memphis Supercluster training started at 4.20 a.m. local time. It's a bit of a joke, 4.20, but still, mm -hmm. this means that the Supercluster is now active and in production. 100,000 liquid-cooled H100s on a single RDMA fabric. It's the most powerful AI training cluster in the world. Okay, this is why this is such a big deal. He announced today that they have just uh, turned on the most powerful AI training cluster in the world. This is a significant advantage in training the world's most powerful AI by every metric by December this year. And he's confirmed also that Grok will be there. Oh my gosh, Jeff, what do you think? This was a message to recruit the best talent in the world. Uh, out of universities and away from existing companies. Why else wouldn't you want to work on the, in, and have the most powerful supercluster under your feet when you're doing uh, this type of development? Why would you want to be anywhere else? You have to answer that question. Um, and I think this was really a call to talent. This is also um, getting there, you know, first, because te honestly, Tesla, XAI, um, they've been behind. Some of these other companies have been... Yeah. Uh, buying up and installing this capacity and, and, you know, Elon and the team are playing catch up. And now, so they, what they've done is they built one single, you know, super, the biggest single one in the world, but this is really a call for talent. It's massive news. Okay. So the next story is both Elon and Ashok Alaswamy replied to this. And so I'd like to share this. You got a, this very well-known technologist, John Carmack. He's working on AGI, uh, but he's the former CTO of Oculus He's the founder of ID Software, and um, so he wrote this, said that Tesla's full self-driving has made significant strides in the last year, and I'm feeling very confident about this bet. So I'll show you the bet that he made a couple of years ago. I've made multiple two-hour drives without touching the wheel. I wouldn't have wanted the task of leading a self-driving effort for a couple of reasons. There was uncertainty. The working on all the possible situations might be an AGI complete problem. You can't get there until you get AGI complete. You, almost, you work almost everything out, but you just can't get that crucial last bit reliable enough. I now think they will be able to, to data it across the finish line without any research breakthroughs. 
So basically, no more research in the card on you know breakthroughs. They just you know add more data, move fast, and break things. Really, is the most effective way to build new things, and that just isn't an option with passengers on public roads. So cheers to the team for attacking a daunting but grand and worthy task. So he previously, in uh, two years ago, 2022, he said, I have another long-term bet. I bet this guy coding horror $10,000 that by January 1st, 2030, completely autonomous self-driving cars meeting level five will be commercially available for passenger use in the cities. So he, this is referring to that bet that he referred to earlier, that he's very confident that he'll win that bet. Well, Ashok Laswamy, the director of autopilot for Tesla, replied, if you liked FSE 12.4, you're going to love 12.5. This is confidence from the guy building it. This isn't just Elon saying, you know, trying to get this team motivated. This is this is directly from Ashok himself. And I take that seriously when you hear him say 12.5 is going to be great. Elon replied also, said Tesla has done so much that would be considered AI research breakthroughs, but we are laser focused on making it work rather than crow crowing about breakthroughs. Having a large fleet is only one piece of the puzzle. Plenty of other car companies produce way more cars than Tesla, but are nowhere on generalized self-driving. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a number of things here. First was the the is the technical leadership at Tesla to separate what the target should be for the team because John, John Carmer was talking about you know this worrying about you know getting to perfection when in reality it just needs to be many times safer than humans. Humans on the road today are not perfect. So if it could be many, many times greater and statistically proven to be many times greater than a human on the road today, then then the end the end state or the end target doesn't have to be perfection. It can be something before that. And then you can continue to work on that until you get to to full AGI. So the dis creating that distinction and then setting up the data collection scheme, the training scheme, and you know, getting the best, you know, AI talent in the world to work on uh a real product moving through the world. This is the real world AI. And then cre knowing that a lot of the compute is going to be happening as well on the perception side and then figuring out the unit economics for this whole thing of, you know, how much are you going to pay other people for, for stuff, you know, and, and basically it, Tesla designing their own perception and inference solution for the vehicle took the cost structure way down took the ownership level way up and allowed them to vertically integrate the solution. So you have people from Tesla's reliability teams, people from their engineering teams that can converse directly with people doing layer one software on the silicon, doing the hardware on the silicon saying, look, this is how this needs to be, this is how it needs to perform. So they can do a purpose-built purpose -built chip for the solution and, and then fully engineer it top to bottom and then not have to pay another supplier, another company like NVIDIA margin on every car you build and every you know bit of software you put on that car to do those interactions over AI. So it's a big deal the way Tesla approached it, but that distinction of what the end target can be, you know, for it to be good enough to be out on the road, you know, so basically, you know, uh, waiting for perfection versus, you know, just getting it to be quite good enough and much better than humans, I think was the real um, one of the real breakthroughs, I think, the way Tesla approached it, that's Elon, that's his leadership. It's exciting to see Ashok uh, and the team. You always want to hear from the, the, you know, the full team. Love hearing from Elon. You want to hear from the full team as well. So there's lots to plot there. But Tesla's unique approach here is going to win out, and they're going to be able to do it at scale, volume scale, and economic scale. Big deal. Thank you so much, Jeff. I am loving today. We have so many fun stories, but also very important. And almost all of them are breaking information. Here's another one. So just this morning, information was shared. But first, Lex Friedman said this. I visited XAI and Tesla supercomputer clusters in Memphis and Texas, okay, and was blown away by the rapid rate of progress. It was fascinating to watch Elon and the team constantly improve every aspect of the process. You just talked about this, exactly this. Uh, also, as a human, it was a bit surreal and humbling to walk around inside the brain of a giant super intelligent computer that is quickly becoming more powerful. This future is going to be wild. Here's the photo of Lex with Elon as they walk around um, the supercomputer clusters in both Texas and XAI. And then Elon said, maybe the AI can finally make Half-Life 3. <laughs> as a joke, everybody's waiting for that game. 
Lex Friedman and um, Grand Theft Auto 6. Uh, but the reason why we brought that up is because this news story just came out this morning. So Sawyer reported that in addition to Fortnite, the Tesla Cybertruck is also coming to Rocket League tomorrow. That's 250 million people play both of these games every month. This is Rocket League, Drive the Future, Cybertruck Tomorrow. I'll play a video of that. But this is from Fortnite. So this Cybertruck is not only making ways with celebrities, it is coming out with video games and 250 million people. What do you think, John? I, it's, when I drive my cyber truck, kids, you know, they're hanging their head out the window. They, the kids know it. The kids <laughs> see it. These promos are out 250 million, you know, from, you know, all ages, but we're honestly, you know, the kids all the way up through, you know, people in their thirties, forties and fifties that are playing these games. And, uh, mm -hmm. it, 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 the product looks cool. It's, uh, it's, it's something that people objectively want and it's a good product. So you couple all those things together, you know, everybody wants to be the cool mom, cool dad, you know, cool friend or whatever. And they want to have, you know, that product. So it, it kind of shows you kind of that cult success, um, that, you know, this, the product is creating, I think Tesla is going to create other products, uh, in its likeness. I think, I think it is becoming a hit. And then, you know, with the XAI and the, and the cluster coming up and kind of walking through that. It is a very unique feeling. I, I built one of the largest smartphone mm. factories actually only in, in the US at one point in time. And it is, you kind of sit in there when it's all done and it may be completely empty and you just look around and you figure out, you're like, like we built this and this is what it's going to do for people. This is what it's going to do for people's jobs. This is how it's going to change, you know, in the case of the super cluster could change humanity forever. And uh, it's a, it's an, it's a, it's an unbelievable feeling. It's, it's something you can really, understand if once you're you're kind of there and inside of it so uh really exciting news in terms of the super cluster it's an actual brain and so you know that yeah. this thing's thinking and generating ideas and thoughts and yeah. answers and then the cyber truck the you know it's clearly the best product it's the best vehicle that's out there right now you know that but a lot of people were saying some people are going i don't know if i can get with the looks or not when you see celebrities doing this when you see video games and then they really you know, make it sexy, it becomes um, past that. And I think, the, you know, almost everybody will think this is the most yeah. gorgeous thing in the world. All, all the, all the conversation too. all the, you know, sometimes there's this negativity, like trying to tie Tesla to politics, this other side of it, showing it attached to video games, ce celebrities, the greatest athletes in the world uh, and other celebrities that are, that are to me, this more than counteracts it because these are people with, million hundreds of millions of followers on social media uh one more quick comment about the super cluster besides it being a massive uh, uh recruiting element to put this news out and the work all night to get it up and going the other big thing in all this is around utilization when this hardware ships from nvidia to me and if i'm someone like elon who's spending billions of dollars of the company's money to me as soon as that that the that product leaves NVIDIA or leaves TSMC, the utilization clock starts and you want to get as much utils, you want to get as much uptime. You want the product up and going because every minute that that compute is not working and is not moving the ball forward is your, it's basically this giant furnace, you know, of money. Same thing of like building a new factory. So uh, there's, a, there's very, there's huge corollaries between a, a you know, a hardware factory and is what they're doing inside of these sites. And, and the key thing is around utilization. So that's the other reason he kind of, I, I get this asset, I buy this asset and I want to work all night basically to bring it up and get it going. All right. So if you look at what we've just covered so far, we talked about humanoid robots, Elon talking about that, FSD 12.5, Elon talking about that in Ashok as well, and now super clusters. The, nothing else I want Elon to be focused on except for walking around the super clusters. And like you said, getting it up as fast as possible. It's a top priority for him. 
So meanwhile, let's cover what other companies are doing. Um, you just saw this as big news uh, story that just came out as well. LG halts GM battery plant. Stellantis pays big fuel economy fines. Let's play a little bit of that video. Now Bloomberg reports that LG Energy Solution is slowing construction of its third battery plant with GM because of that slowdown. The plant is being built in Michigan and construction of the $2.6 billion facility started in 2022. It was supposed to begin operations in the first half of next year, but now it's not going to happen by then. Okay, Jeff. Yeah, I, I study these, these relationships are very in, in, important. This relationship, so the Ultium battery, the batteries in, in GM cars going back to the Bolt, it's been a partnership with LG and it's, it's honestly been a disaster, especially with the recalls, the lawsuits, all the, the fines, everything that LG had to deal with and GM with the bolt fires. And now you have this news of when you have this news of like, we're halting construction, it's the worst thing in the world in the manufacturing world is to, is to plan a, a manufacturing facility, start the construction and be some percentage of the way done and slow it down. So what you're doing in that situation is you're trying to slow the burn rate of capital because you realize the structure that you were building is not going to have the same ROI calendar, return on investment calendar that in timeline that you originally thought it was going to have. And now it's becoming extended out much further. So the, mm -hmm. so if you can reduce your inflow of capital into it, you can reduce your burn rate or and you're basically conserving capital. So this is a bad thing. You started something, you're part of the way through it, and now you're stopping it, and now you're trying to conserve capital. Meanwhile, there's all these grants that are flowing in from the U.S. government, again, to GM, to Ford, Stellantis, for this EV conversion, to their suppliers, too, for this EV conversion. So, I mean, I'd almost like to just, just from this show kind of announce, I think this needs to be formally investigated by Congress because this is... I've, I've never seen anything, the, the, the billion, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars that are flowing from the government to these companies for EV transition. The work isn't happening. The transition is slowing. They're pointing back to the customer and saying the customers don't want EVs. Customers want good cars, regardless of the propulsion standard, at the right price. So if they could build a profitable EV below you know $40,000, they would sell a lot of them. So that's the fundamental problem. So anyway, there's a lot of there's a lot of news to me that's wrapped up in this headline. But you know, this is the third battery plant uh, that they've they've started up together, and now they're basically halting it. So there's gonna be no production, no activity out of it, and they're gonna try to get all their production out of their their first two in the existing plants. And nobody knows what utilization that they're running at as well. So big news. Oh man, Jeff, I love it because uh, you and I have been doing the show for about over a year maybe close to two years, and you you say things and you teach us and they almost always come true, not just margins and earnings, which is, you know, your call and supply chain costs. You've been warning and saying that the battery companies, as they partner with non-Tesla companies, if those non-Tesla companies, like these other automakers, they have lower volume, they keep cutting their volume down over years, LG and PYD and the other battery manufacturers won't want to risk it again. Here, you've actually started a plant, then you cancel halfway through. Who are they going to give the best, uh, you know, who are they going to be the yeah. best ag agreement with? Who are they going to commit to? Who's going to give their their first batch to? All their batches, if they could. The company has yeah. never once backed out. You've been saying this, and it's getting worse. Yeah. And once you halt, you know, halt is the first step. Most of these things turn into full-on cancelization, you know, the full-on cancellation and it, it's 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 just a bad situation because LG invested, GM I, I'm sure did some level of investment, but they probably put it mostly on LG at this phase. And now you're if you're LG and you get a new demand say let's say GM remember this is a partnership, the supplier is depending on the OEM the original equipment manufacturer GM to produce a product that people want to buy and want to buy in volume. If they want if they produce a product that people want to buy in volume then LG can fill up their capacity. They can run their they can run their factories at high utilization, get their cost structure down. They can make a bunch of money 
GM can make a bunch of money. But when GM is not doing their end of the business in terms of getting vehicles out there at the right price point profitably, therefore they take their own demand signal down. So saying basically every EV I produce, I'm basically, you know, putting 10, 20, $30,000 in the glove box and shipping it out. And, and so now the partnership breaks up. GM's not holding up their end of the deal. They have to tell LG, look, hey, our demand is going to change. But out, outwardly to the news media, they're saying, hey, consumers don't want these yet. That's not the mm -hmm. truth. Consumers want a good product at the right price point. So when, these, when this partnership breaks, when GM does finally figure it out, or when Ford does finally figure out how to make an EV properly below 40,000, if you're GM or you're SK or you're Samsung, you're one of these battery manufacturers, you're gonna, or Panasonic, you're gonna look and, and they put a new demand signal and say, hey, this is gonna be the product, this is gonna be it. They're gonna second guess it. And this is what happens in this world. And this is where all of a sudden you hear, quote unquote, supply challenges, supply chain challenges, is you have the partners second guessing themselves. So you don't have this right now at Tesla. They're very disciplined with how they do this. And uh, they create a supply chain where if you're a supplier and you ship a part in the Tesla, they produce the product faster than anybody in the industry. Then they have no channel inventory, basically. Literally none. There's no dealer network. It is the best thing in the world to be a supplier to Tesla. It's actually right now the worst thing in the world to be a supplier to GM or Ford. Even though they produce more cars, your cash goes in. It takes longer for, for, the, for the OEM to go out and reorder new product from you because their supply chain network is so long. Their planning, yeah. is, therefore, is so bad. And then whatever demand signal you get from them is just, honestly, it's most likely inaccurate. Guesses. Okay, let's cover another fun story <laughs> because we know that uh, these other car companies, so everybody says, oh, Elon is always lying or stretching the truth. Tesla keeps saying that there's autopilot, full self-driving coming and never comes. Well, let's take a look what other car companies have done. Uh, Omar, of course, is joking when he said Elon lied to the public about Tesla producing fully autonomous vehicles by 2021 and then delivered nothing. Ah, wait, sorry, I got mixed up. It was actually every other company that promised and failed to deliver autonomy while the Tesla AI team brought FSE to millions of users. It is funny how the, the people say this. So here's your, um, you know, you got your photo, you got your Ford targets fully autonomous vehicle for ride sharing 2021. This is in 2016. Okay, so they're promising autonomous vehicle by 2021. GM, self-driving, cruise, origin, de definitely delayed amid major subjects, uh, setbacks. Ford initially planned to launch, oh, I, I think I got this in the wrong order. Uh, they initially planned, but delayed into 2022. Volkswagen Autonomy opens in Silicon Valley to help bring autonomous vehicles to market. This is 2020. Toyota is launching a 2.8 billion self-driving car company. This is 2018. Nissan. Right now, the company will be ready with multiple commercially viable autonomous drive vehicles by 2020. This is uh, the Mercedes E-Class. It's 2016, on the road to autonomous driving. And then there's Mercedes, 2016. Love it or hate it, the autonomous, it's slowly weeding drivers out of the equation altogether. And then you got BMW, 2016. It's working with Intel and Mobileye to make a self-driving car in five years. They're all been promising it, Jeff. It's... Uh, not just Tesla, but who's actually delivering? It's Tesla. So we've got to bring this yeah, out next time somebody says things like that. With the benefit of history, if you can look at these things in 10-year blocks and be able to look backwards, you'll realize that, you know, from, you know, the kind of the start of the Model S all the way through, Tesla built a vehicle that was a springboard to other vehicles. They built supercharging. Then they built a battery supplier partnership. But they did all these things. And the return on invested capital for all those partners of it and Tesla was greater than anybody trying to do those efforts in that in the interim time phase. Now you you go to the next ten years over this call it twenty twenty two to twenty thirty or so time frame. And I think when we look back beyond twenty thirty and we look back on this period of time, the same every one or two dollars invested in the Tesla effort versus the other efforts, you're going to be, you're going to look back. You, right now we're in the middle of it and we're seeing, oh, 12.4 was delayed or this or whatever. But when you look back with the benefit of history, I think you're going to find that Elon and his team are the best capital allocators in the world of anybody doing in the industries that they're in at that current time frame. And this will be proven again. They're going to create the lowest self-driving car system and network that can scale ubiquitously globally 
And with the benefit of time, we're going to look back and say in a dollar invested in that. And then the output would, would be many, many times greater than any other of these other efforts. Ford, Argo AI, they started that effort. They announced it. They deprecated it a couple of years ago. We've seen what's happened with GM and Cruise. Volkswagen, you know, in their effort is basically imploded. And, you know, Nissan, all these efforts, you know, they've started basically all these companies like, hey, we better get started. We better kick this stuff off. But then they're not, they don't have the right plan. They don't have the right technical leadership. And you see where, they're, where they are today. Our next story is Tesla is just killing it. And they're starting to offer a lot of incentives and spiffs. So you've got um, Tesla North America announcing this weekend that 1.99% APR financing is now available for the Model Y in the U.S. It applies to new orders placed before August 31st, must take delivery by September 30th. This is... All the promotions Sawyer added together, Tesla's currently running in the U.S. You got the three months of uh, supercharging for free, and you got to take delivery in S3, X or Y by August 15th. You got a free FSD transfer, take delivery by September 30th. I probably will take advantage of that. You got the 1.99% Model Y financing rate. You got these free paint options for Model 3, uh, performance and seating layout option for Model X, if you add FSD to your order. What's your take on about all of these uh, promotions? Why is Tesla doing this? They are low to zero initial dollar value of front type items to Tesla, and they're very high value items to consumers. And, and therefore, Tesla doesn't take some immediate large intra-quarter hit, but they, they give value to consumers that, by the way, other car companies can't give. You can't go buy a Ford and then get free supercharging from mm -hmm. Ford. You can't do it. So Tesla is giving advantages to their consumers that others, frankly, can't give. And when I look at it as a manufacturing person, I look at the time frame of when they're doing these deals. And I look at this, you know, if you take, if you place an order uh, before 831, they are intently mm -hmm. focused. Tesla has done the, done the economics on the 90 day quarter. And they are intensely focused on maximizing utilization, both in their own factories and in their supplier factories. And they're focused on getting rid of that delivery wave in the third month where they used to do somewhere on the order of 40 to 60% of their volume in that third month. When you do 40 to 60% of your volume in one month of a three month quarter, all the expedite charges come in, the cost uh, per hour downtime increases, you're doing overtime with all your employees, your suppliers are doing overtime and trying to charge you. If they don't overtly charge you, then they're actually, you know, they're putting it somewhere else or kind of hiding it somewhere else in some other charge or not taking their costs down quick enough. Tesla is acting when they do this in the middle of the quarter, they are focused on keeping their utilization rates high in their factories and their supplier factories. And that allows them to extract the most cost reductions from their suppliers and the most cost reductions from Tom Zhu from a COGS perspective in the four walls of their factory. So I look at it. I love it. The, the financing piece of this, we don't know how much of is this is Tesla's covering versus how much the banks are covering. But in this, in this situation, you know, they are looking at what's happening from a Fed funds rate perspective. And the Fed, you know, the Fed went on this hiking spree for a year and a half. And now we are clearly on the other side of it where the next move is going to be lower. This is where Tesla introduced this, these financing deals this year versus they, and they're not touching the sale price. So the, if anything, they're, they're, they're raising the MSRPs at the point of sale. So this is, this is being handled, I think, economically very well by the company, and it's going to help them lower costs and improve gross margins. I don't know anyone else who could have answered that question as well as you just did. Thank you for that. Let's end really quickly with this fun story. You got um, this guy named Dan, Kettlebell Dan. Is the world ready? Is the world ready for dark Elon? Here's a photo of him with laser eyes with the American flag behind it. Well, Elon laughed and then he then changed his profile picture. And now he's got that as his profile picture. Some people are thinking, oh, this is a type of profile picture a CEO changes to be to before their stock rips 10% after earnings Tuesday, which is tomorrow. What's your quick explanation of all this, Jeff? I think it's, yeah, it's a lot of, you know, wishful. Everybody wants to do their own interpretation. There's uh, cryptocurrency interpretations with the laser eyes. There's the, um, Joe Biden did a fun, the Biden campaign did a funny kind of play off of it in terms of, 
you know, this whole thing from a year ago of this dark, you know, dark Biden or dark Brandon thing. So it's kind of like everything coming together. You can interpret it however you want. Um, Tesla does have earnings uh, on Tuesday. Uh, and, you know, the crypto markets did actually turn up as soon as he did that and he changed his profile pick. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I think it's just fun. I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't it's read fun. too much in any one thing. I'm going to stick with my interpretation, which is laser focused, laser focused yeah. on robots and super clusters and, and AI and all that. Thank you very yeah, much, Jeff. We know Follow that. Jeff on X at the Jeff Lutz. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.